thank you for joining in today uh, with the Mountaineer Farm Talk, the voice of West Virginia agriculture. We have a great lineup today. We have Dr. Rocky Lemus with us today. He is the forage specialist at Mississippi State. Uh, he's in the head man of the Center of the Forage Management and Environmental uh, Stewardship. He works with the National Forage Testing Association. He's uh, been part of the CFTM technical uh, schools and uh, he got his PhD from Virginia Tech and his undergrads and masters from Iowa State. So he has been around the country. He's seen a lot of things and I've, he was teaching when I was a grad student at Mississippi State. He come into um, several guest lectures in, in one of my forage classes and our he he done a great job and he knows his stuff so he's here to talk a little bit about annuals today we're also joined with uh evan wilson uh from cabell county and wayne county lisa's on and audrey is also joining in with us today as well so welcome welcome to the uh our little podcast we where it's all about annuals and you're the man on the spot there rocky <laughs> well, John, I appreciate the opportunity to come and, and discuss annuals with you guys. I think uh, this is a great uh, opportunity and niche for utilizing the annual grasses, especially when we look at the cattle industry across the country. Uh, we have producers that want to uh, uh, try to retain some of the uh, calves throughout the summer and try to probably keep them uh, in the fall and take into a cell. So there is an opportunity for uh, using this annual uh, forages to actually fill, fill some of the void and, and provide some better nutrition and, and some gains to, to those calves as they move throughout the summer into the fall. So. Okay, well, uh, uh, yes, and we and I've been trying to push annuals for that forage, increasing that summer slump there. And, uh, you know, what, let's talk about annuals for the people that might not you know, have that in their operation and might not understand quite what we're talking about. Define these annual forages for us. Uh, annual forages is defined as something that you're going to plant either in early spring, uh, mid spring, depending where you're in the country, and they're going to grow just one season. They're going to be able to produce forage uh, used for that season that are planted. Uh, usually, depending on the type of uh, annual that you get in, you might get from uh, 90 to 110 days of grazing. And one thing with the annuals is that they, not, they don't tend to produce viable seed that will come back next year. So it's something that you will have to consider planting every year as a supplemental uh, forage system in, in those cases. Uh, in the South, we use it a lot uh, for the transition. For example, if you uh, our cattle producers have a prepared seedbed with annual ryegrass in the wintertime, and is looking for something to then transition into the summer for grazing, and then those annuals could be used in that transition between the cool season annual grasses with a warm season uh, annual grass in, into that system. Okay, and, and you know, what, um, what time of year should we really be looking at installing these annuals into our pastures and hay fields and and you know what what kind of situations do we need to be moving in because we you know we have a in west virginia we have a good probably a lot colder winter than you have in mississippi and you know we have a, a kind of longer spring we we actually we were talking earlier we actually have four seasons and uh what what does that soil temperature need to be and kind of what time of year should we be looking to put those in but you know, usually depend, depending on location, but especially for us in the south, we planting those is usually mid, mid to early May because our salt temperatures are more adequate. And you may you touch on salt temperatures. Salt temperatures are usually want to see those salt temperatures at least 65 degrees or above, uh, where those summer annuals will be have the opportunity to actually to germinate and get established. So when that soil hits 65 temperature uh, degree mark for us. That's what we're going to try to establish those summer annuals. Um, one thing that we usually have to do is that for us, like I said, it's going to be early to mid May. For you guys, might be early June. You guys might be about four weeks behind us uh, when it comes to soil temperature and weather conditions. But you also want to make sure that you have a good rainfall pattern that allows you to actually get those 
those um, summer annuals established really quickly. Uh, one advantage that we see with the summer annuals is they can germinate very quickly. Usually within seven to 10 days, you might have a scan if you do a good job uh, preparing your seed bed uh, for establishing the summer annuals. Uh, if you have a well calibrated drill that allows you to put the correct seeding rate, you will see that benefit. So, getting up and going very quickly. We have a couple things that can help the producers out there listing in Jackson County. If you're in Jackson County in my county and Putnam and Mason kind of surrounding counties, we do have a no-till drill here at the office uh, that I was able to look up there and put five different pots of money together to get. And uh, I also have a chain disc hair. So if you want to do a traditional planting, uh, you know, with working the ground up, I found out, you know, if you're broadcasting and then drag, drag that uh, chain harrow uh, right over that seed, it works it in just perfectly and you get a great stand uh, with the research that I've done. And then if you want to put that in established, uh, established pastures, we have the no-till drill for you guys, our ladies. Uh, that uh, would like to utilize that. So that that is something to give us a call down here at the Extension Office. We can help you with that. Now, Rocky, uh, what's the benefits of, you know, let's talk a little bit about grazing these first. No, we'll talk a little bit about maybe putting them up for hay here in a little bit. You know, a lot of people like Sudan grass here, Sudex uh, in our county. It, it does a little better in droughts, you know, where the, then the pearl millets, they need a little bit more water. So if you're on these ridge tops, you know, you might get a little drier and that Sudex seems to work better. What, what is your opinion? Should we be trying to put a light drilling into these pastures or should we have a area specifically solid Sudex and then time graze or something like that? What's the benefits of those? Well, you know, uh, one of the benefits that I like to see, I, I like to see it more in a pure stand uh, where you, you have allocated land to finding the summer annuals. Uh, and the reason for that is because depending if you have grasses in there, it's going to put a lot of pressure in the competition for germination of those summer annuals. And in some cases, you can do some management practices like a do a, 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 a light burn down with a gramoxone, which is fire quiet. If you want to suppress uh, your, your pasture for establishing summer annuals. But also that put heavy pressure on those summer on those perennial grasses coming back and having competition. Uh, in your case, might be something that works very well because you guys got a lot of fescue, uh, possibly orchard grass in those systems. So orchard grass and fescue like that shaded area. So coming below that uh, summer annuals like a sorghum so that grass, sudex, or forest sorghum or permeable might be an option in that case. Uh, but uh, for us in the south with the competition of veneer grass and bahia grass that comes very early in the season, uh, we usually do not try to do that, uh, uh, that approach because we get a poor stand. So one thing is making sure that if you're investing in the summer annuals because they are not cheap, is that actually you'll be able to get a good stand and be able to utilize it, especially in grazing systems. Um, I think one of the major issues that I see in grazing system is that sometimes producers are so concentrated on how much biomass I can get before I put the animals in there. So sometimes uh, if you let it go too tall, you're gonna get a lot of trampling from the animals. So I usually, when I'm looking at the summer annuals, depending on uh, if I'm using per millet, I like to see those to be about 24 inches to 30 inches tall before I start putting animals to graze in there. Uh, if I'm looking at sorghum sudan like Sudex or a four sorghum or sorghum sudan hybrid, then I'm going to go to that 30 to 36 inches grazing high before I put the animals in there. I want to try to maximize utilization of those summer annuals instead of letting the animals trample a lot of that uh, grazing potential that you might have. Where do you stop the animals at when they get, you know, we need to anything we do we need to give it a rest period to come back and it, we do not need to graze it too tight you That's know right. or cut it too low if you're talking about hay but we're talking about grazing at this point uh where do we need to stop grazing that in height and let it start growing back 
You know, when it comes to grazing, I like to see at least a six to inch, six to, ta- to eight inches double height mm-hmm. uh, with, the, with the sorghum sedan hybrids or forest sorghum. Usually with the permanently, you might be able to get about five to six inches permanently. Usually if you got good weather condition, it regrows really quickly. Mm-hmm. So, but it's important that you leave a stubble height in there that allows enough material for the regrowth and get a second or third uh, grazing cycle out of that, that pasture. Because these annuals, correct me if I'm wrong, you're, you're definitely smarter than I am in this, uh, <laughs> this situation. Now, if some of the annuals, you can have a problem if you graze them really low with that uh, growth node maybe being a little bit higher up on those plants. And if you graze it to the ground, you can have trouble with that plant regrowing back, correct? That's correct. Because, you know, the one thing that we try to, to protect is inside the stock that that stock, that summer annual, if you're using any of these summer annuals, you, you have a what we call a growing point. And usually after uh, 45 days, that growing point is above the ground. So it's that and that could be in that, you know, surface to about six inches tall uh, area. So you're trying to protect that growing point so it allows actually to put new regrowth, new shoots. And that's why the, we see the problem that if you graze it too short, sometimes you might only get one grazing cycle and you start losing the, the stem very quickly. Okay. Well, Evan, you've been mighty quiet. I want to I wanna throw the ball in your court. What you got there? Okay. So in my neck of the woods, we don't have very many people doing summer annuals. So when making a decision, what? how do you determine, okay, I'm going to go summer annuals this year? And what are your, what's your process for that? Well, we have a lot of guys, they have traditional pastures up here, fescue orchard grass, and then they have some hay and some feedlots that they use for the winter. But what, what's your recommendation for somebody to go in with summer annuals? You know, you, you have to have a goal. If you have, and the way that we use it down here is if you have uh, calves that you try to put weight in the summertime and try to make you take them to market in the fall, that will be a good opportunity to increase uh, some of those gains because summer annuals are really high in, 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 in nutrition. They have really good crude protein levels. They have really good uh, carbohydrate levels, sugar, energy, what we call total digestible nutrients. So it allows those calves to, to get an early start compared to our traditional grasses. Uh, for you guys who have a more full season system, are not so much pressure as we are in the South. Usually uh, our traditional uh, perennial warm season grasses for us, like by hair grass and bermuda grass, are gonna be much longer in quality. So by incorporating those summer annuals, especially for those young calves that you try to develop, you're giving them the opportunity to put more animal daily gains and probably be able to get better conditions as you go into the market in, in September. So it might give you a competitive advantage of getting a better price, uh, you have better gains on those, uh, and be able to, to get a better return as well. Awesome, thank you. What's the cost now per acre on some of these annuals? I know uh, maybe it might be a little bit higher up here than it is in the South, because y'all have more you know, people ordering seed, and, and you get it probably a little bit more of a bulk price than we can up here. but what, what have you seen is kind of the cost per acre usually putting this in seed-wise? Well, seed-wise, I'm going to talk more from the seed point of view. I think, you know, when, you know, if we look at the whole system, you, you need to take into account, you know, land preparation, fertilization. But from the seed cost point of view, uh, depending on the seed rate, you might be looking at 60 to $90 an acre uh, on seed. Uh, so, so depends also what you use and are you using. I know sorghum sedan hybrids are you using for sorghums or permillet. Uh, I think it, the more the more popular these days is the sorghum sedan hybrids, the Sudex. So you might be paying a little bit higher prices for those because the higher demand for those. Um, personally, I from the point of view of grazing, I'm a big fan of the permillet for us in the south. Uh, we, we get really good gains on it. Uh, there's not a lot of trampling from the cattle and, and we actually be able to get, because we get more moisture than you guys uh, this time of the year, they regrow very quickly for us. 
So usually when we graze spare millet, uh, two weeks later, the regrowth is already there about 10 to 12 inches. So we can actually turn around and put those calves in those, in those pastures very quickly. What about uh, fertilization? Uh, you know, because I, I was raised in the annual, you know, we time graze and we have pasture and that, that was kind of a norm for me you know, growing up in the South with pearl millet. That was kind of my granddad's go-to was pearl millet. We sow pearl millet every year. Our, uh, and he didn't really, you know, he didn't really try Sudex. He was kind of set in his ways like most farmers. Mm -hmm. They find something they like that works and they stick with it and that's fine. But, uh, but what about fertilization on these plants once you get them established and, and maybe a little bit of nitrogen or whatnot, what are you looking for on uh, nitrogen uh, on these plants? You know, one thing that I always tell producers is before we even think about establishing permanent, we usually take a soil sample. We try to follow soil sample recommendations for uh, lime, phosphorus, and potassium. And, and usually some, some producers say, well, can I go ahead and put the nitrogen out when the plant does feed? I do not recommend to do that because, you know, depending on weather conditions, it might sit there for two weeks. By the time that those uh, summer annuals start to germinate, that nitrogen might be gone. So my suggestion is that when it comes to fertilization uh, with phosphorus and potassium, uh, follow the soil test recommendation. Once you have uh, that seed had germinated and it's about two inches tall, then I will come back and I recommend to put about 40 to 50 units of nitrogen uh, to get that uh, uh, summer annual in good shape and produce a quick, a, a quick growth. Once I do my first uh, grazing cycle and it start to regrow, you can drop down to about 30 units of nitrogen that, and that should be sufficient to provide all the biomass that you need for the uh, duration of that summer annual. And I'm really glad you mentioned soil samples because uh, we push soil samples here. We have great programs in the state. We offer a free soil sample through the, the college here. And me and Evan, you know, as ag agents, we go through beating the soil sampling drum every year. I, we go into schools, we go into every meetings, uh, you know, and we really push soil samples and, and uh, we really promote that very well. And, and we've actually improved our soil sample uh, techniques. Uh, Ed Rayburn and uh, Tom Based, and they've kind of worked together to they revamped it over the last year or so. And, 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 and it's really nice for you producers that might not have given uh, or taken a soil sample for the last couple of years. They have a uh, sample A and a sample B, a recommendation for each recommendations that, you know, the A is if you own the property and want to fix it up. And the B is if you rent the property, what do you need to maintain it? So that kind of gives you a choice, you know, on, you know, if you're trying to build or maintain. So, you know, I kind of like that. And we went from our actually uh, parts per million from pounds per acre in our, our, our technique. And we still, of course, recommendations are pounds per acre because that's what we're putting fertilizer out there. But- And, uh, and I do think that soil sample is the economic saving of any forage program. If, if you are not taking a soil sample in, and making sure that you are doing a good nutrient management, uh, you will you not only impact it, you solve production, impacting your overall system. And, exactly. and how you look at the long term, uh, to me, soil sample is a long term investment to invest into sustainability of any grazing system. If, if you know, we talked about regenerative agriculture, but regenerative agriculture starts right there, balancing your nutrients so you can then be able to utilize uh, grazing rotations and manure deposition to continue that cycle. Uh, so soil sample to me is an essential tool to forage system no matter where you are in the country. That is absolutely right. Don't guess, soil test. That's our That's motto. Right. <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, so we, we kind of got the seed. We know when to plant, we know what to plant. Um, we we know how to fertilize soil sample. Okay, let's let's get into grazing now. As far as the you know, of course, 
first we look at the soil nutrition because everything comes from the soil. The plants and the animals are eating the plants, so it all goes back to soil. So we got that covered. Let's go into the plant next. Then what are we looking at? Uh, have you? I know it's going to vary. This going to be. It's probably going to be. This depends. Uh, that's probably going to be the answer. But you know, crude protein and TDN for these animals or nutrients to the animals. What have you seen kind of as far as nutrients uh, going into the animal? And I know that has to do with maturity and soil, uh, soil fertility and everything else. But what have you seen? Well, you know, with, with summer annuals, they are very good plants. If you've done a good job at fertilizing it correctly at the right time, you're looking at levels that range all the way from 12 to 16% crude protein for some of the summer annuals. So, you know, it, it's a very high quality forage if it's managed correctly. Uh, sometimes we see also a producer, well, I want to add a little bit more protein like that to that raising system. And then what we're seeing is, and, and then it's an easy way will be to incorporate an annual legume, like cowpeas. Cowpeas compete very well with the summer annuals. So it could be an easy option also to incorporate a leg, an annual legume along with that if you think that you're not getting to that level of protein that you want to be at. But also sometimes by incorporating some of these annual leggings, you might be able to drop down a little bit of the amount of fertilizer, that, or natural fertilizer that you're putting out. And, you know, you, we mentioned earlier also about natural fertilizer, and I think, you know, making sure that you're using a, a source that is more suitable for summer conditions is very important. Because, if, you know, we try to use urea in the summer, you might see a lot of volatilization. I, I don't know what the situation in West Virginia is with ammonium nitrate. But if you can use ammonium nitrate, I think will be the, uh, the, my top choice if you can get it and put it in, in the system because you don't lose it. Uh, my second choice will be a combination of blend that is in the market called UV ammonium sulfate, which is a 33% uh, nitrogen uh, composition. And probably urea will be my last option in that system. Uh, so, so protein is impacted by two factors fertilization, how much nitrogen you put it out there, but also maturity. So usually when you are in that, uh, depending on which summer annual you're using, if you're in that 24 to 36 uh, uh, inches of growth, uh, you should have between that 12 to 16 percent crude protein, depending on which of the species that you're using as well. Usually we see that per millet tends to be more leafy, so you might see a, a higher nutritive value on per millet compared to what you see with a sorghum sedan or a forest sorghum where you have more uh, stalks, less leaves. So your leaf stem ratio changes in that system. So that will have an impact on how that, that nutri nutritive value is also distributed in the plant. Okay, okay. And another question that my producers I know would want me to ask Prussic acid, you know, you, you get a little drought, you get a little damage on that, that plant, you know, especially with some of the Sudans. Uh, what, what are we looking at and how dangerous is that? Uh, prussic acid, you know, as you know, it's a gas. It's a cyanidic, a cyanidic gas that is produced mainly for stress. Uh, we don't see a lot of prussic acid in, in our region in the summertime. Due to drought, we see more nitrate accumulation. Which okay. nitrate is one of those that I will consider is, is, is a key that can kill an animal at any time. And the reason for that is because nitrates, um, they accumulate in the, in the tissues of the plant and they don't dissipate. So if you graze in it or if you put in your summer annuals for hay I will, and you suspect that you were in a drought situation, I would highly recommend that you take a sample and get a, a nitrate test to see where the levels of nitrates are. Anything's above 15,000 uh, 15, parts per million, or which is one and a half percent, will be very detrimental to cattle. Uh, usually anything less than 6,000 parts per million will be safe for me. And if as you see that increase, then what we do is that you make sure that you are uh, strategizing how long those cattle are gonna graze on those pastures, or how much allocation of hay I'm gonna let it have to actually minimize that risk. Uh, prussic acid is one of those that is a gas. So it, it dissipates very quickly out of the plant. 
is we see prussic acid accumulation under uh, cold conditions that you get a frost and you got summer annuals out there that there's a good tendency that probably those plants are going to accumulate some prussic acid. So my recommendation from the management point of view is if you get a frost and you got summer annuals out there, remove the cows, wait about seven days, and you can put those cows back in there. Uh, it's it, it like the Johnson place. grass then, right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in the summer, if we see prussic acid accumulation, we usually see it also uh, when producers, if there is, there's a stress on those plants and they use a product like 2,4-D, Mm -hmm. We see an increase in prussic acid accumulation in those cases, then we might see the problems in the summer. Uh, I'll be more concerned about nitrate issues in the summer than I will be with prussic acid, and I'll be more concerned then about prussic acid related later in the fall when I start, those temperatures start to drop. Now, I've never done this, but I've always heard this. Now, tell me if this is true or not. If a, guy, a cow dies with nitrate poisoning, if you cut the jugular and the blood almost looks like chocolate milk, is that is that is that a correct? Uh, uh, you know, usually sometimes you know it depends. Uh, what you see is what happens is when you have nitrates, they bind to in, to the hemoglobin and mm -hmm. blood. So it, what it's doing is depleting the oxygen from attaching and binding to that hemoglobin like we have in our blood. So they cannot carry oxygen. So basically they get asphyxiated really quick. So yeah. that's why you see that their, their eyes turn blue really quickly. Uh, if you cut the jugular, you might see more dark color, mm -hmm. a really dark color. I, I, no chocolate, a little bit maybe darker than that because there's no oxygen in there to, to, to turn it really red like yeah. the hemoglobin does. Like the cherry red that you see after mm -hmm. it blooms, you know. Okay, okay. Well, Evan, I, you know, I don't want to leave you out there. <laughs> Are there any other challenges our, our producers need to think about later in the season besides the, the acid talk? Any sort of diseases, bacteria? You know, I, I don't think so. I think one of the, uh, you know, one of the things that we're seeing from the pest management system is uh, probably you guys don't have it yet. We have it in the south a lot is that our summer annuals like uh, the millets and the forest sorghums, uh, they do well the first part of the season. And if we plant late, uh, sugarcane aphids is a major problem for us. Uh, and so, you know, once we get into late July, August, they, the sugarcane aphids get into the leaves of those, these annuals. And they, what they do is basically, they're sucking up that sap of the plant. So you end with the leaves that are very, very uh, sticky, like sugar, because they're pulling all the sugars and the leaves start to die. So what has happened is that it's not impacting so much the quality, but the yield that you might have for those animals. Uh, we've not seen any issues where uh, the sugar cane aphids have uh, posed a threat to animal health. Uh, we have we grazed it here and we haven't seen that. Uh, one thing that is very hard is to control the sugar aphids because even though if you try to use an insecticide, those aphids are underneath the leaf of the plant. So it's very hard if you're doing a, a, a broadcast over the leaves to get them. So my recommendation would be to go ahead and graze it. And that's another reason that I like um, per millet as an option for us in the south because fur millet is very resistant to sugar cane aphids. So we don't see those issues on fur millet as we see with uh, uh, the sorghum sedan or the four sorghum in those situations. Uh, you guys might be lucky that you know, it's not yet present uh, in your area. Uh, so this probably something you don't have to worry about. Okay. Well, let's move on a little bit to the hay section. We talked about the pastures. Um, you know, if if producers are starting to wrap these bales, you know they're they're getting planting these these stands and and wet wrapping. We've seen a lot more wet wrapping in our part of the country, but because mainly of weather conditions, cannot get the hay up. They want to make good hay in that that boot stage when they want to cut, so they buy the the wet wrapping. And that's really personally, you may disagree with me. For a beef cattle operation, dry hay is good good enough. 
for dairy, yeah, we might go to wrap bales, but I understand trying to get this out of the field. So the wet wrapping works well with the summer annual uh, uh, kind of production plan. What do you think about uh, wet wrapping these annuals and feeding them in the fall? I, I think it's a good option. Uh, I, I'm a big fan of bellage. I think bellage works very well with the summer annuals. Uh, one thing that you need to be uh, aware is, you know, you go into a fermentation process. You want to make sure that they get fermented really quick. So when you cut in uh, the summer annuals for bellage, uh, you want to be in that 40 to 60 percent uh, range of moisture content in that in that biomass. I use 50 percent as a mark. Uh, one thing that you producers need to be aware of that when you're using the summer annuals for bellage, uh, and it goes back to planting, planting rates. Okay? So most of this summer annuals will be planted sometimes between 20, 25 pounds per acre. So if I know that my intent is to use bellage, then I'm going to go to higher seed rate, maybe 25, 30. And the reason for that is because I want to have stems that are not very thick. So I can actually be able to process them really quickly. Uh, if you have really thick stem and you try to bail those, you can actually puncture your plastic really easy. And when you puncture your plastic, you don't have an anaerobic fermentation on that bailage anymore, and you start to lose that product very quickly. So by increasing my, my seeding rate and I encourage those plants to be more competitive, so I have uh, less diameter on those those stems, and you can um, uh, go ahead and, and dry them quickly. Uh, but also, if you have a more conditioner, it's easier and a more conditioner to process those and then wrap that uh, produce those bales that you can wrap very easily. Uh, when it comes to fermentation, there are also people out there that use uh, inoculants. There are some inoculants that you can hear for bellage uh, in the market. Some of them have benefits, some of them do not have a lot of benefit for us in the South. I think the key is making sure that you have the right moisture content in, the, in that bill at the time of wrapping. And one problem that I've seen a lot with producers in the South is that uh, our environmental conditions, you know, heat and humidity, that, bell, that hay can dry really quick. So it's very important that you cut enough to wrap within a couple of hours after bailing. If you cut too much and you bail too much and you're spending eight hours trying to wrap that, those bales, probably you're going to have a lot of bales that are going to go bad in the fermentation process. What about dry hay? Is it possible to do a thin planting in, in your hay field and dry it down quick enough to make dry hay? Or do we really need to stick with these rat bales instead of trying to cure this hay down for dry hay? You, you can do dry hay as well. You know, they fit very well into dry hay system. I've never seen a problem where we cannot use it as a, as a dry hay. I got several producers that are cattle producers that are going to be uh, feeding dry cows in the, in the wintertime, and, and they're using this summer annuals as an option for that. Okay, okay. All right, and what about like uh, smother crops. You know, if you want to go in and revamp your pastures, is is these annuals a good source of, for a smother crop? Definitely, they are. Uh, you know, it, it's something that let's say you have a pasture of uh, Kentucky type one fescue that you want to renovate. Uh, we usually recommend to use the smother spray, smother spray system. So while with that fescue, you can come in the wintertime or last fall in the wintertime and spray it a couple of times with glyphosate to try to get that, that uh, under control. And then you can come back and prepare the, the seed bed and go ahead and plant one of the summer annuals so you have something for the summer. And it helps to outcompete that fescue and you can spray again then in the fall and go ahead and then establish you, your new stand of either N5 free or, or no N5 fescue that you want to use. Uh, this is also, these summer annuals are also a good transition for alfalfa. Let's say that you have an alfalfa field that is getting to uh, the end of life, three or four years or five years, depending where you're at. 
and, and you don't have a good stand anymore and you were thinking about renovating that alfalfa remember that you cannot uh, establish alfalfa into alfalfa within about a year so yeah. on that transition there's some annuals can be incorporated into those those areas where you had alfalfa let those uh, summer annuals actually benefit from all that nitrogen that the alfalfa is leaving behind as well. Okay. Uh, you might have some alfalfa plants in there that might get harvested along with, this, with, the, uh, with the summer annuals. So you're actually improving the quality of either your bellage or the hay that you're making in that type of system. There you go, there you go. And we're, I'm trying to get everybody to, you know, either a manage the Kentucky 31 we have all over the hillsides, or B use those novel endophytes and and, and snuff those that do uh, endophyte out of there, uh, that toxic endophyte in that 31. And we're we're not as lucky to be like you know in Starkville you can and uh, I know definitely West Point in, in the Black Mesa up there, uh, they have that tall fescue Bermuda mix. Oh, I would love. Right to have tall fescue Bermuda mix because it, I mean, it just takes right off and you got spring and summer forages and y'all are blessed to have that mixture. But up here, we kind of have that summer slump because we're all cool season. So, uh, but yeah, and, and uh, so I, I would love to have that here. Evan, do you have any other things you want to cover? I don't, but there was a question in the chat box. I'm not sure if he covered that or not. Um, oh, yes. Okay, go ahead. I see it now. Um, from Lisa Bell here. Yes, what top three annuals provide the best advantage for success all the way around? You can go. Okay, you know, there's, there's, there's several annuals out there, okay? And, and I, I don't think we talk about all the summer annuals, but when we talk about summer annuals, there's, there's more than just uh, permelid, sorghum sedan, and forest sorghum. There's tough grass, there's crack grass, so depending on where you add, there are some of this that might have a benefit. Uh, if, you, if you know that you are doing a transition between a, a cool season annual and a warm season annual, then you probably want to consider something that receives very well. For us, in that case, crabgrass is a good receiver. So we can use crabgrass as a summer annual, mainly for grazing. We use a lot for grazing, not so much for hay production. Uh, Teff grass is another summer annual. But summer tough grass fits better into a hay production system, from my experience working with tough grass. And the reason for that is because tough grass is a very has a very shallow root system. So when uh, cattle try to graze it and they wrap that tongue around that plant, what happens is that you they're pulling all that plant up. So from the point of view of having a summer annual for Hay production, tap grass might be an option as well because it's very high quality forage, very leafy, that fits very well into the cattle or the horse market as well. A uh, horse, horse market is a, is, is, is a big hit with having that high quality, uh, very leafy forage production in there. But from the point of view of a cattle production system and looking at yields, uh, the top three will be permalid, sorghum sedan, and a forage sorghum. That will be my consideration for that. Hey, Rocky, this is uh, our dean. He is visiting our office today, and I didn't want to get fired, so I've been a, 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 kind of shutting my office here for about 15, 20 minutes, but I was going to go out and introduce him. This is Rocky Lemus. He is the far specialist at Mississippi State. Hi, how are you? Good. Are you in, in Starksville? I'm in Starbucks, you say. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite familiar with that. If you see Gary Jackson, who is now in a different position, tell him I say hi. He's a good, yeah. dear friend of mine. He's, he's, my, he's my big boss. <laughs> All right, well, I'm Jorge Atiles, and I, I, I've been here for a year now. Okay. And I used to be at, at Oklahoma State for about 10, and then 17 in Georgia. Oh, cool. So you've yeah. been all over the place, just like me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you got to keep it, you know, interesting, right? <laughs> yes, sir. But no, I didn't. I didn't want to leave you out, and no. I, I wanted to kind of introduce. And and well, this is a podcast. Actually, this will be a recording, so oh, wow. our producers okay. will be able. We do this every Friday at ten. Yeah. And our producers, we get specialists like Rock, uh, Doctor Lemus here, that is experts in the field, and we're talking about annuals today. We're All kind right. of wrapping that up. But awesome. I'm gonna we'll go back and we'll finish up. But thank you for visiting. I'll be back here in a little bit.
let me walk back to the office here. But uh, yeah, thank you. I really appreciate you coming uh, on the show here, Rocky. Uh, Anytime. We are really glad to have you. Uh, we've been trying to get specialists from around the country and and I tried to pick the best ones and when we talked about annuals but your your name popped in my mind. Well, yeah, you know something that we didn't mention uh, earlier when we we're talking about grazing management that you just came to my mind too is you know sometimes producers if they are planning to plant summer annuals uh, it's important that they determine how many acres they're going to be planting and also not to go ahead and plant everything at once. Uh, because if you plan everything at once, what you're doing is uh, giving the opportunity for the summer annuals to grow very fast. And if you don't have the uh, enough cattle in there to graze it very quickly, then it's going to get to maturity very fast. So my suggestion is usually, let's say that you have a producer that wants to plant 10 acres of summer annuals, I would recommend, okay, I'm going to plant five now and I'm going to wait two weeks and then I plant the other five. So that gives you enough time that you can start your, your grazing system and by the time you get out of that first five acres, you get into a very high quality, uh, at the right stage type of growth uh, forage that might give you that benefit of not losing that quality and maintaining that gain more consistent than if you go from a good quality pasture to something that's very mature where you're impacting how those gains are going to be on those calves. Mm -hmm. And the stocking rates uh, is another thing that probably we need to mention. You know, when, when we, talk about, we talk about stocking rates, uh, uh, usually for us down here, uh, if we're talking about calves, uh, I try to put at least two calves that are 500 pounds average per, per acre. That's a good number. If you're doing a more intense rotation, you can probably get to about 1,200 1200 pounds per acre. Uh, depending also on which forage, forage annual you're using in there. Okay. Another thing that I like to do also, especially if you, if I got um, uh, sorghum sudan hybrids or, or sudan grass or forage sorghum that I'm using in this system, I like to try to use what I call a strip grazing system. Uh, letting have X amount of area in the pasture for a couple of days so they can graze it more uniformly instead of trampling the whole area. Uh, with a street grazing system, you want to make sure it's always start closest to your water source. So they want you, they want, you want to have probably one strand electric fence somewhere in the pasture that they can graze that. Once they finish that, you drop that, that one strand electric fence and move it forward, but you leave in the back open so they can get to the water because they already grazed that area you're going to minimize any trampling on any standing forage that you might have in that field as well. Oh, yeah, that is a great idea. And, and a lot of uh, something is getting popular in here in West Virginia is bale grazing. So uh -huh. if they have a bale grazing operation, they already have the materials to do the strip grazing with the annuals. And uh, I know at, at my granddad's farm, he had it set up where he had two water sources at each end. And then he started, he split it in the middle, and then he started on one side and grazed out to the middle. And then he rotated them around to the other side and started at one end. And that way the other side had time to regrow while the other side was being grazed. That's correct. So uh, that worked out good for him. Uh, so, but every operation obviously is different. So mm -hmm. you're going to just have to find how these annuals fit into your, your yep. production and, and go with it. But, and you uh, want to make sure that you're maximizing the uh, the potential of those summer annuals if you invest in money on those. Exactly, exactly. Get the bang for your buck, right? That's correct. <laughs> we all know that there's not a huge profit margin in farming, right? <laughs> it's very, so we got to make every dollar you count. Have to be, you have to be smart and strategic how do you, you maximize your utilization of your forage. That's right, that's right. And the way I start is with a soil sample. Uh, so, uh, but any, anything else from anybody? Any questions from the uh, audience or anybody that might be joining in here? We've got Audra up there from, I think she's in Ritchie County or Tyler County, if I remember right. Do you have any summer annuals going on up that way? Sure. 
you might have stepped away. They have. There's yeah. a lot of potential in Ritchie County. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of farms around there. So we got to keep something on them, keep this olive olive that's taking over this country off, <laughs> keep it in production. So, but thank you so much for joining us uh, on the Mountaineer Farm Talk. And um, hopefully we can, Rocky, we can, or Dr. Lemus, I'm sorry. I, I, guess I, 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 I like to go by Rocky. I know you do, but I don't want to be disrespectful. <laughs> so thank you, Rocky. I really appreciate you coming on and, and we'll we'll find a reason for you or a topic to get you back here. Oh, Rocky's a bull rider, right? He, I used to be. I'm yeah. retired now. <laughs> I, I always tell everybody, I said, yeah, we got a good specialist at Mississippi. He's an old bull rider. <laughs> <laughs> but no, thank you for the opportunity. It's been a pleasure to be with you guys. And uh, uh, thank you to uh, all those producers out there that are listening. And John, hopefully next time I'm to West Virginia, I'll, I might give you a call and stop by and get a tour of the county. Hey, come on by anytime. I'm good for lunch. I'm, uh, you know, we can, we can, turkey season, we can set you up, uh, deer season, we can set you up, just come on up anytime, now, make sure it's about the week of Thanksgiving, because that's the opening day of rifle season, yes, like, sir. We, we can get you, we can get you on a deer stand, too, so, <laughs> but it, it was nice to see you, and nice to have you on here. Thank you so much, have a good day. You too.